So uh, next is, uh, it, it's a small world. Uh, ben and I actually have a lot of friends in common out on the West Coast, and we just met last night for the first time. Uh, I had no clue that he was in this social circle of mine, so I'm pretty excited to hear what he's got for us today. So uh, without any further ado, Ben Armani. Hello, hello. It's amazing that someone would actually let me speak in a church. <laughs> so I had to I had to take the opportunity. I just I, I think I may be the only speaker who doesn't live in New Hampshire at this point. I don't want to uh, spoil the plot, but I think that may be, that may end up being temporary. I, I want to say thank you to all of you guys. I, I've never felt so welcomed in my entire life among a group of relative strangers. So that's some, that's something very, very special, and uh, I, I, I don't take it lightly. Um, since we were planning on doing this in a church, I wanted to take the opportunity, and I think that it's, it's wonderful, not just with the topic, living a voluntary life, and the theme that has been so much about how entrepreneurship, in particular, can lead to liberty and can create a better life for people, it's, it's amazing to me that that is not spoken about more often. Uh, I think those of us who know and who have read enough about economics understand that it, it actually is the difficult way to get what you want, but it's the nonviolent way. The economic means as opposed to the political means. Obviously, the easiest way to get what you want is to get a bunch of your friends together, get a bunch of guns, and go and take what you want. It's much harder to persuade people and in the past couple of days, the threat of violence brought against peaceful individuals. So the title of this is an agorist sermon. And as an agorist myself, as someone who's made his living for a very long time in, in black and gray markets peacefully and has become relatively well known for it, uh, you know, obviously one of the gentlemen who I have a, a very uh, close relationship is a face that I see rather often, Benjamin Franklin. And <laughs> some of you got that one, right? And uh, Ben Franklin, come to find out, was very, very influenced by the words of a, a quite famous religious figure who spoke in churches. I know this one was probably a couple, built a couple hundred years after he was doing his speaking, but he and his family wrote and spoke in churches built on this very land. A guy named Cotton Mather, I'm sure people who are from this region have, have heard those two names. He's named after the, uh, the sires of either side of his family, both of his, his grandfathers. You've probably heard the Cotton last name and you probably heard the Mather last name living in this area. So Ben Franklin, in a letter to Cotton Mather's son, said, uh, when I was a boy, I met with a book entitled Essays to Do Good, which I think was written by your father if I've been, as you seem to think, a useful citizen, the public owes the advantage of it to that book. And when I read that, knowing Ben Franklin, knowing how he's lionized, the only non-president on our money, an entrepreneur himself, known for that, a printer, member of the media, as many are here, great writer, speaker, thinker, scientist, and I said, isn't that interesting? The book that influenced him, and that drove me to look and see who was this guy, Cotton Mather. So further in that letter, Franklin recounted a visit he'd had with uh, Cotton Mather. This was later in Mather's life. They both loved books, and they visited Mather's library. Ben Franklin was impressed by this guy. And as he's leaving, he turns, he leaves, and Mather says, Stoop! Stoop! And he keeps walking, thinking, I wonder, what, what, it, what is this? And uh, he hit his head on the low beam, <laughs> he was being told to stoop down. And Mather, who uh, never missed a chance to give instruction, said, you're young and you have the world before you. Stoop as you go through it and you will miss many hard thumps. And Franklin wrote to his son, I often think of it when I see pride mortified and misfortunes brought upon people by their carrying their heads too high. And I think that that's why it's very important for us. I fall into this all the time. The idea that I know what we're doing is right. I know that the precepts that we hold are moral. I know that I'm the ethical actor. And sometimes you can walk through life knowing that. 
And you need to really be stooping. You need to be remembering, what is the purpose of liberty? Why do you need to be free? Because certainly the people on the other side are free. If you want to be free to hurt others, assault others, kidnap others, put people in cages, you can be free to do that. They'll train you to do that. They'll pay you to do it. They'll pin medals on your chest to do it. But if you want to be free to do good, that's a different story. So that's what this is all about. And that's what's been going on. And that's what we're struggling through. It's a struggle to be free so that we can do good, so that we can practice nonviolence, so that we can bring better things into this world and into other people's lives. So this has been an ongoing story. This is a chapter in a story that's been going on in this location. And I think it's why I'm attracted to it. Because all of these things that we know started here. Nascent, the experiment, 400 years ago. And yeah, we look at it and we say, oh, it was people escaping and wanting religious freedom. But they did a lot more than that. It was more than religious freedom. Cotton Mather, let's go back to Cotton Mather. In uh, 1640, well, let's do this. 1689, Boston Revolt. The Puritans, led by Mather, took over Boston. They actually took over all of New England, which had been changed from the colony into a dominion. Had introduced a church, had taken away a lot of liberties that they had been practicing, that they had written down. No, it wasn't great. Cotton Mather's also remembered for uh, infamously being the gentleman who allowed the Salem witch trials to go forward because he allowed spectral evidence. They had asked him, is this an okay evidence to use that these little girls are, are, are seeing spirits? And he said, ah, it's probably not a good idea, but you know, in an emergency, it could be used. And as I say, the only thing that's necessary for evil to prosper is, is for good men to do nothing. And in that case, he did nothing. It haunted him his entire life. He actually became a man of science. He introduced inoculation, smallpox inoculation into the Americas. He became a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences after that. Guilt. That, uh, that particular revolt left New Hampshire without a formal government for two years. So for the anarchists, <laughs> 1689. An experiment in anarchy, right here. And nothing went wrong, and I'm pretty sure that they uh, were still able to build the roads. So, <laughs> what, so what were the liberties that, that they were so upset were taken away that they actually took over the government at the time and were willing to live without one? 1641, Massachusetts Body of Liberties. The rights contained in the Bill of Rights, as a matter of fact. 1641, people experimenting up here with freedom of speech, a right against uncompensated takings, a right to procedural due process, a right to bail, a right to a jury trial, a right against cruel and unusual punishment, and a right against double jeopardy. Never tried before. Never tried before. And this was the experiment right here. Now, like I said, they weren't perfect. Witchcraft, well, you're killed for that. Homosexuality, dead. Idolatry, dead. But it's a start. And I think that that's where you stoop. That's where you have the humility to know that, yes, these men and women went down in history as being forefathers of liberty, but they got so much wrong. And we're going to get a lot wrong. And we're getting a lot wrong every day. And it's going to come for someone else. So liberty in our lifetime, 400 years later, some things are better, some things are worse. The wheel's going to turn. This is a new chapter. What we have to remember is the why. The why. Why should we be free? Why should we want more liberty? And it's to do good. So I'm going to give you a little bit. It influenced Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin has certainly influenced me. <laughs> he influences me every day. He's influencing my pocket right now. So this is Essays to Do Good by Cotton Mather. I'm just going to give a brief summary, and I think that we can walk away that even at that time, 
the reason to fight, the reason to develop new forms of liberty, new ideas, was to do good. So he opens with, a capacity to do good not only gives title to it, but also makes the doing of it a duty. Because once you know it, once you know that you can do good, it's standing right there in front of you, which is the reason to keep it in your consciousness. And it's not for selfless reasons at all. He actually ends, I'll bookend it, he actually ends it after listing off a, a great number of intellectual pleasures that he has. He loved reading, he loved learning new languages. He says, none of this would afford the ravishing, the ravishing satisfaction, much, much less would any grosser delights of the senses do it, which he might find in relieving the distresses of the poor, mean, miserable neighbor, or anything to redress the miseries under which mankind is generally languishing. Because I think every entrepreneur knows how good it feels not to get paid for what you do. Because that's just mandatory. You have to. You have to sell a product. That's not what feels good. What feels good is to have somebody come back who's a customer and to tell you, that changed my life. Thank you. My life is better. I think of my, my mechanics, and I'm, I have this great, great mechanic in Las Vegas, and I'm always surprised at how fast they do the work, how friendly they are. I'm always shocked that it always costs less than I thought it would. And it's always fixed when it leaves there. And anyone who's ever had a bad experience with a mechanic knows that that's not some small thing. I can tell the people laughing, those are the people who have had the bad experience with the mechanic. It can ruin your day, it can ruin your week, your month, your year. And that's what we're about. It's not just about making money. You have to make the money. Because if you don't make the money, you can't do good every day. And isn't that what we want to do? And the great thing about it is, I look around and I see it being embodied. Everything that's being talked about, it's being embodied. We all know it somewhere deep in there, otherwise we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be sitting in this room. Next, and this one's also embodied. Just a man articulating it. Next he says, in the home, let every man consider the relation wherein the sovereign God has placed him and let him devise what good he may do that he may render his relatives the better for him. And I think that was embodied by this panel that was up here. It's not going out, marching in the streets, that's really going to make a difference in your life and your ability to do good. It's with your family. It's with your children. First you, then there. Start there. That's why we need to be free. That's why we need to be free for ourselves. That's why we need to be free of how we're going to raise our families. That's why we need to be free to make decisions about how to educate our children and not have to worry about men with guns coming to the door and taking them away. And it's because we want to do good in the world. And what better good can you do than to create children who will do good in the world? Then he says in the neighborhood, this excellent zeal should be carried into our neighborhood. Neighbors, you stand related to one another and you should be full of devices that all the neighbors may have cause to be glad of your being in the neighborhood. That was something for me with my businesses, what I always tell people, especially if you want to have an agorist business. Your neighbors have to love you. That neighborhood should be better for you being in it. Better. Because then what? When the fire marshal comes knocking on the door to shut you down. And shut, if shutting you down makes the neighborhood worse, if removing you from the neighborhood and the good that you're doing in the neighborhood makes the neighborhood a worse place, if you get shut down, you win, because you've just taught the neighbors. You've just converted them. The state just made it a worse place. So how do you do that? Make your neighborhood good. And then, finally, and honestly, this is where he says doing good ends, which I thought was very surprising. He was ne he'd never held political office. And these were congregationalists, so they didn't believe in a state. They believed that governance should end in a congregation about this size. Enough people to fit into a church, enough people to fit into a town. That's what this society was built on. No state, no governor. 
they dealt with the governor, right? They allowed him, they tolerated a governor because the governor didn't do anything. So he said, in society, it is to be proposed that about a dozen families, more or less of a vicinity, agree to meet the men and their wives at each other's houses once in a fortnight or a month at such a time as may be agreed upon and spend a convenient quantity of time together. And such a meeting should look upon themselves as bound up in one bundle of love and count themselves obliged in very close and strong bonds to be serviceable unto one another. And I think it's right here. I think this is where it starts and this is where it ends. A society of families that want nothing more than to be good people themselves so that they can be good to their families, so that they can be good to their neighbors, and so that those neighbors can get together and be good to one another, and that's it. And that's why liberty is necessary. That's what we're fighting for. What we're fighting for is not just some abstract idea. It's not, it's not a philosophy. It's not some idea on paper. It's not some bygone era. It's because we want to do good, and people are preventing that. And the people who are preventing it are free to do evil. So, liberty in our lifetime? I don't know. 400 years later? But the fight for liberty in our lifetime. The path to be able to walk down the path in our lifetime. To be able to leave something for the next generation. That we can do. That we can really do. And that's happening. And when will liberty come? And maybe I'll end with this. I said I'd bookend with Martin Luther King. So most people know his uh, I Have a Dream speech. Not actually my favorite speech. Not by far. Drinking whiskey in the church is amazing. <laughs> so my favorite speech of his is actually, uh, bef he made it before March 1965, March 25th. It was rather impromptu. It's, there's videos of this. Great speaker could speak off, off the cuff and often poetically. I think many times that he had actually practiced a lot of things that he was doing in his church. So things that seemed like he was freestyling, I think he was cheating a little bit, as many, as many MCs are, are known to do. So uh, I'll just give you the end when somebody asked him, how long is it going to be? How long? Is this whole movement, is this whole thing going to take? And this is what Martin's response was. I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. How long? Not long because my, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift my soul to answer him. Be jubilant my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Thank you.